The topic that I have been assigned to address with you this afternoon is the topic of should the church embrace postmodernism? No, thank you very much. It's been a joy to be with you. Now, if, if our response to postmodernism is suspicious at the most charitable and gravely concerned in the main, why should we even spend time thinking about a topic like postmodernism together? The governor of Mississippi, Haley Barber, uh, during the Reagan administration worked on the staff of the White House and on one occasion he was in Air Force One in the president's quarters as they were crossing the country to come to the western United States and as they were at about 35,000 feet crossing over the Mississippi River right at about the point where his hometown of Yazoo City was and where his wife and his two sons were he asked the president if he could have permission to call Marsha, his wife, from the red phone on Air Force One. And President Reagan gave him permission to do this. And so he called up Marsha in Yazoo City at their home and said, Marsha, this is Haley. You'll never believe where I am. Where are you, Haley? I'm on Air Force One. I'm in the president's private quarters, and I'm calling from his hotline. And she said, well, you know where I am? I'm in the laundry room. And the kids, the kids have been throwing up all night. They've messed up all the sheets. The washing machine is broken. And I don't have a husband here to help me. <laughs> and he said, well, okay, Marsha, I'll catch, 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 catch up boys with you when I get to California. Bye. <laughs> you know, the fact that he was in the president's private quarters in Air Force One really didn't matter much to Marsha at that time. And you may be thinking something like that about postmodernism. Why should postmodernism matter much to me? I've got to put food on the table, and I've got to put clothes on the back of my family, and I'm trying to serve the Lord in my own area of life. Why in the world do I want to spend time studying postmodernism? Well, I've got three reasons why I think it's worth your time, and why I think it was wise for R.C. to make us think about postmodernism. And the first reason is simply this. If you don't understand postmodernism, you don't understand the soup that your fellow travelers in this culture are swimming in. If you don't understand postmodernism, then you don't understand uh, the stuff that is in the air that we're all breathing in this particular time and place in our cultural life. Postmodernism, as we'll learn, has been around for a number of years, and some would say is already fragmenting and breaking up and turning into something else, but it's pervasive. You find its attitudes everywhere in our culture, and if you don't understand it, you're going to be missing something that is a major part of our cultural life. And if you're missing that, it'll actually harm your ability to witness faithfully to the truth of the Bible and to the gospel into that kind of cultural suit. The second reason why I think it's important for us to understand postmodernism is that if a person truly embraces the tenets of postmodernism, then it inoculates him or her to the gospel. If a person truly embraces the tenets of postmodernism, it actually makes it more difficult for them to hear the claims of truth that are being pressed by the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel. And that ought to concern us all. Furthermore, and this is sort of an addendum to that second point, for true believers who dabble with the ethos and philosophy of postmodernism, it weakens their discipleship at critical points. And so for that reason, I think it's important for us to study postmodernism. But there's a third reason as well, 
And that third reason is this. There are many, many well-meaning Christians, including evangelical believers and church leaders, who think that in order to speak into a postmodern culture, the church must to some extent adapt itself to that postmodern culture. That we must embrace postmodernism, at least in some aspects, if we are going to be able to address postmodernism. Now, I want to suggest to you that that is a disastrous approach. And I'll explain why later on. But I think that all three of those reasons, certainly there are more that we could give, but all three of those reasons are good reasons for us to pause and take 50 minutes or so on a Saturday afternoon and think together as believers under the authority of the Word of God about this movement, this mood that is described as postmodernism. Here's what I'd like to do with you in the time that we have today. Let me apologize to you ahead of time for the terminology that I'm going to use because the terminology of postmodernism is often vague and esoteric and technical. And I'll do my best to make what is vague as clear as possible and what is esoteric as unhidden as possible and what is technical as specific and uh, open to public understanding as possible. Uh, but the very nature of postmodernism uh, entails a certain vocabulary that makes it difficult to grasp some of the concepts that are being conveyed. But what I'd like to try and do with you today is this. I'd like to define postmodernism. I'd like to describe postmodernism. I'd like to talk about seven specific aspects of postmodernism that have been suggested to us by James Sire. And then I'd like to talk about how this tenet, this ethos of postmodernism works itself out when it comes into contact with Christianity uh, by way of assessment. And then I want to close by pointing you to an example of how the Apostle Paul dealt with dominant cultural beliefs that were out of accord with the gospel that he was proclaiming. So that's what I want to try and do with you today. So let me start by attempting to define for you postmodernism. And I want to say at the very outset that postmodernism works very hard not to be defined. And some postmodernists would say it is undefinable, but in the very act of defining postmodernism, you're defying the essence of postmodernism. But let me give you several different ways of describing or defining postmodernism. One of the main features of postmodernism is a pre-commitment to relativism or pluralism in relation to all questions of truth. In other words, postmodernism from the outset takes a relativistic stance towards truth. It wants to be pluralistic and relativistic in relation to all truth claims. Let me say that another way. Alistair McGrath has said, for postmodernism, all belief systems are to be regarded as equally plausible. Something is true if it is true for me. Christianity is acceptable in the postmodern framework because it is believed to be true by some, not because it is true. And therefore, the Christian apologist in dealing with postmodernism will want to stress that Christianity believes itself on grounds to possess insights that are both true and relevant. And so the truth question is important for Christianity, but for postmodernism, the claim of absolute truth is discounted. Postmodernism as a cultural and intellectual phenomenon has existed since probably the 1920s. 
but in our culture, it came to fruition after the 1960s. It began to uh, gain a certain momentum in the 1960s and uh, rose to prominence after the 1960s. Postmodernism refers to various movements in reaction to modernism that are typically characterized by a radical reappraisal of modern assumptions about culture, identity, history, and language. And again, to say it one more time, for postmodernism, truth is socially constructed. Truth is not something that is absolute. It is not something that has an objective existence. It is socially constructed. If I can sort of phase in from those vain attempts at defining postmodernism to describing postmodernism, let me try and elaborate on what I've just told you. If I could draw one column that says modernism, what postmodernism is reacting to, and one column that says postmodernism, here are some of the contrasts between modernism and postmodernism. Modernism which is a term that often refers to that period of intellectual life in the Western culture that stretches from, say, the philosopher Descartes into the early 20th century, uh, believes in rational, scientific, and logical means of knowing the world and is optimistic that we can understand the world around us. Whereas postmodernism reacts against rationalism and scientism and the objectivity of the truth claims that were made by those who embrace modernism. In modernism, there is absolute universal truth that is understandable through rationality and logic. For postmodernism, there is no universal truth and rationality by itself does not help us truly understand the world. For modernism, and this is of course secular modernism that we're referring to, humans are material machines. We live in a purely physical world. Nothing exists beyond what our senses perceive. Postmodernism is suspicious of those kinds of dogmatic claims to knowledge, which is one reason why postmodernism is open to all kinds of spiritualities as long as you don't make any universal truth claims. So you can believe that we ought to worship little green men on Mars as long as you don't expect anybody else to believe it. And that's another truth claim that's validly at the table of discussion. For modernism, humanity is progressing through science and reason. There is a progress of humanity. For postmodernism, progress is viewed as just a way to justify the domination of European culture of all other cultures. So the ideal of progress according to postmodernism is simply a tool of exploitation against the rest of the world cultures. In modernism, history is a narrative of what happened with a point of view <clears throat> and cultural and ideological interests. For postmodern historians and philosophers, there is a question of the representation of history and cultural identities. History is not what really happened because history is always written from one group's point of view. So we really can't get at the question of what really happened. History is all a power play to express the interpretation of one particular group of events for their own purposes. So this gives you a taste of the difference between modernism and postmodernism. Now, postmodernism, as I've already mentioned, has 
historically defied definition. And this has led someone as rigorous a thinker as Noam Chomsky to question whether postmodernism is simply meaningless because it adds nothing to the analytical or empirical knowledge that we possess. And he observes that very often postmodern intellectuals will not respond to your questions for clarifying their views or justifying their views in the way people will respond to your questions in the fields of physics or mathematics or biology or linguistics or in any other field. And so Noam Chomsky says this, there are a lot of things that I don't understand. Say, the latest debates over whether neutrinos have mass or the way that Fermat's last theorem was apparently proven recently. But from 50 years in this game, I've learned two things. One, I can ask friends who work in these areas to explain these things at a level that I can understand. And they can do it without any particular difficulty. Two, if I'm interested enough, I can proceed to learn more so that I will come to understand it. But when I read Derrida and Lyotard and Foucault, all of postmodernists, and any ads about Foucault, I knew him and I liked him. They write things that I don't understand, but they cannot explain those things to me in ways that I can understand, nor can I figure them out on my own. And that leads me to one of two possibilities. A, he says, maybe some new advance in intellectual life has been made, perhaps by some sudden genetic mutation, which has created a form of theory that is beyond quantum theory, topology, etc., in its depth and profundity. Now, that's one possibility. Possibility B, he says, well... I won't spell that out. <laughs> David Hume used to say that if you couldn't explain your theory, if you couldn't add to the empirical and the analytical, then you ought to consign your theory to the flames. And that's, that's what Noam Chomsky is saying about postmodernism. Now, postmodernism is an ethos and a mood as much as it is a worldview. In fact, I would argue that it may not even be a worldview. It tends to be a reaction to a worldview or worldviews or a taking of a worldview to its logical extreme or a little bit of both. But Jim Sire, I think, gives us seven helpful points in understanding postmodernism. I'd like to explore those with you for just a few moments today. Seven helpful points in understanding postmodernism. You will find this in his chapter in the latest edition of the book, The Universe Next Door. The Universe Next Door. And it's in the chapter called The Vanished Horizon. And in that chapter, he gives this seven-point outline designed to clarify just what postmodernism is. And here's the first thing he says. The first question that postmodernism addresses is not, what is there? You know, what is prime reality? What's out there? What is this that we're studying? Nor how we know what is there. So it doesn't ask the question of ontology or being or existence, nor does it ask the question of epistemology. How do we know what is and exists? Rather, it asks how language functions to construct meaning. In other words, there has been a shift in first things from being to knowing to constructing meaning. 
So postmodernism is not concerned about being or knowing, but about constructing meaning. This goes back to the idea that um, truth is a social construct. We construct it ourselves. Uh, one interesting illustration of the way this kind of thinking can run amok is in the story of one of the prominent American uh, postmodernists and deconstructionists, Paul Deman. And uh, I'll just give you a, a, a quote from a passage about his story. One aspect of postmodernism that illustrates this trend, the truth is a social construct, and reflects its obsession with texts and language is deconstruction, the critical method that virtually declares that the identity and intentions of the author of a text are irrelevant to the interpretation of the text, followed by the observation that in any case no meaning can be found. All interpretations are equally valid or equally meaningless, depending on your point of view. As Paul DeMann, one of the leading American proponents of this approach, declared, the very idea of meaning smacks of fascism. This approach blossomed in the post-Vietnam America and was given intellectual respectability by academics such as DeMann, Jeffrey Hartman, Harold Bloom, and J. Hillis Miller. There is a great illustration of this. Uh, Don Carson, a friend of ours, was giving a lecture on Paul in the Chicago area at a consortium of theological seminaries, and there were not only evangelicals present, there were liberals present. And one of the liberals present was a professor from another institution who believed in a postmodern deconstructive hermeneutic and that you needed to apply that to the Apostle Paul, and she was very exercised and agitated by the view that Dr. Carson was presenting in his paper. And so when the paper was presented and the time for questioning came, she uh, rigorously objected to his hermeneutics and articulated this view uh, that uh, a text does not inherently have meaning in it that uh, we bring to the text our meaning and it's in our interaction with the text that meaning is created. And uh, therefore she was protesting his particular view and posing a question to them out of that basis. Now, I would never have been as fast on my feet as Dr. Carson, but here's what he did. He, he said, oh, okay, I, I see what you're saying. And he repeated her question to him back to her exactly opposite of the way that she had phrased it to him. So that he said, now, oh, okay, I, I see what you're saying. You're asking me such and such. And he repeated the question back to her. So it was exactly opposite from what she had asked. And she was furious about this. She said, no, 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 you're, you're misunderstanding me. That's not what I said. What I said was this. And then he would repeat it back to her another way, but exactly opposite from what she had said. And he did this about four times, and she was becoming more and more frustrated by his inability to articulate what she was asking him in the question, and in fact, saying the exact opposite. And then he stopped and he said, ma'am, it seems to me that you care very much that I represent your question the way you ask it. I would simply suggest that we give that same courtesy to the Apostle Paul and listen to what he said and attempt to determine his meaning instead of importing our own meaning on to the text. And the point was well taken. She was very concerned that she be understood, but she was ready to impose her own meaning on the text of Scripture. Well, this is a very typical postmodern attitude or ploy. But the irony about Paul DeMann is that Paul DeMann says the minute you start talking about a text having meaning, you are very close to fascism because for postmodernists, language is all about power. Truth is all about a power game. 
claims to meaning is all about power. And so he's very critical of this because when you claim truth, you're trying to get power over another group. But listen to this. The lunacy of demand's position only became publicly apparent with the sensational publication of some articles that he had written in December of 1989. The New York Times reported the discovery of anti-Semitic and pro-Nazi articles written by Demain for the Belgian Nazi newspaper Le Soir. A scandal resulted. Was Paul Demand's deconstructionism an attempt to deny his own past? Was Demand himself a fascist trying to escape from his own guilt? Nobody could very well argue that he had not actually meant that he had actually meant something different from the impression that he had created in those articles. After all, the author's views were, according to deconstruction, an irrelevance. No attempt could be made to excuse Demain by an appeal to his historical circumstances. For Demain himself had written that considerations of the actual and historical existence of writers are a waste of time from the critical viewpoint. Deconstructionism thus seemed to sink into the mire of internal inconsistency. So there's, there's the first characteristic of postmodernism. Postmodernism first addresses the question not of how we know what is there, but how language functions to construct meaning. In other words, there has been a shift from the first things, from being to knowing to constructing meaning. The second thing that Sire says is characteristic of postmodernism <clears throat> is the death of truth. Truth about reality according to postmodernism, is forever hidden from us, even if it exists. All we can do is tell stories. Truth is forever hidden from us. We can only tell stories. So the uh, famous uh, critical literary uh, theorist Edward Said says, no longer a coherent cogito, a thinking thing, man now inhabits the interstices, the vacant interstellar spaces, not as an object, still less as a subject. Rather, man is simply the structure. The generality of relationships among those words and ideas that we call the humanistic as opposed to the pure or natural sciences. And of course, Nietzsche said this even more strikingly when answering the question, what then is truth? You remember his answer? It is a mobile army of metaphors, metonyms, and anthropomorphisms. In short, a sum of human relations which have been enhanced, transposed, and embellished poetically and rhetorically, and which after long use seem firm and canonical and obligatory to people. Truths, though, are illusions about which one has forgotten that is what they are. Metaphors which are worn out and without sensuous power. Coins which have lost their pictures and now matter only as metal and no longer as coins. And so in postmodernism, there is a death of truth. Third, in postmodernism, stories give communities their cohesive character. <clears throat> One of the things that we hear people say as they commend postmodernism to us is that postmodernism is about stories. And what we need to do is we need to embrace that and we need to tell stories. Well, I want to say a couple of things about that. First, upon, first of all, has there ever been a time when human beings didn't like stories? I mean, at, at bedtime, when you were putting your children to sleep, when they were three and four and five-year-olds, they didn't say, Daddy, please, let's do algorithms. <laughs> they said, Daddy, tell me a story. 
Now, there's nobody in this building that loves doctrine more than R.C. Sproul, but how has R.C. Sproul been explaining doctrine for 40 years now? By articulating it carefully and then illustrating it with wonderful stories and narratives that bring you in and give an understanding to the bedrock doctrine that he's articulating. So the idea of using stories is nothing new in human history. That's not postmodern, that's human. But here's the trick with postmodernism. Postmodernism says it's all about the story. It doesn't matter whether the story is true. And Christianity says, oh, contraire, Pierre. If the story isn't true, it doesn't matter. Isn't that what Paul is saying again? We're back to 1 Corinthians 15 again. If Jesus is not raised from the dead, we're of all men, most to be pitied. It absolutely matters that the story is true. But this is precisely where postmodernism revolts against Christianity because postmodernism doesn't like what it calls meta-narratives, grand, broad explanations of realities. It wants to invent its own stories and tell stories and allow... Uh, stories to illustrate the perspectives and the experiences of individuals, but it doesn't want an overarching true story by which all other stories must be measured. And so postmodernism will say, yes, stories give communities their cohesive character, but they don't want to accept truth claims, and they don't want to accept the stories are true or that truth is relevant to the power of those stories. And my friends, in that context, it is so important for us to stress that we believe that Christianity, we believe in the Bible, we believe in Christianity, not simply because it is good, but because it is true. Because it doesn't matter whether it's good if it's not true. And very often the people that are encouraging us to embrace postmodernism in the church want us to embrace this postmodern indifference to truth. Well, fourth, Sire says, in postmodernism, language is power. Language is power. All narratives mask a play for power. And any one narrative used as a meta-narrative is oppressive. And so again, postmoderns do not want a grand overarching explanation of everything. They reject that because they view narratives as masking a play for power. It's a way of exercising your power over others. Fifth, in postmodernism, Sire says, there is a death of the substantial self. There is no substantial self. Human beings make themselves what they are by the languages that they construct about themselves. Now, if that sounds like existentialism to you, that's because existentialism is a step in the direction of postmodernism. And you'll see this uh, throughout the literary writers in postmodernism. Sixth, Sire says, postmodernism is about being good without God. For postmodernism, ethics, like knowledge, is a linguistic construct. It is a linguistic construct. Social good is whatever society takes it to be. I was in a debate uh, at a liberal arts institution in another state a few years ago, uh, and the debate was on the subject of can we believe in truth and morality without God? And on the panel was, there was another fellow evangelical Christian who's a philosopher who has a ministry out of California. There was an atheist 
uh, philosopher of religion who was on the faculty at that institution. There was a liberal United Methodist minister who was indebted to the postmodern theology of George Lindbeck, who taught at Yale on the panel. And there was a Jewish scholar who also teaches on the religion faculty and the philosophy faculty at that college. And in the course of this argument, the Jewish scholar came out and baldly asserted that morality was entirely a social construct. Now, we were allowed to rejoin with one question after each presentation was given. And so after this Jewish scholar had talked about this, um, and it came my turn to ask him a question, I said, I have just one question. And my question is this. If morality and ethics is simply a social construct, can you conceive of a society in which the extermination of six million Jews by Hitler in the Holocaust would be morally acceptable? Now, I, I, let me tell you, very frankly, I thought surely at that point, this Jewish scholar, who is a, at a personal level a deeply kind and compassionate and in many ways ethical man, I thought surely he would say to me, no, there is no culture in which the extermination of human beings uh, like in the Holocaust occurred could be morally acceptable. But that was not his answer. His answer was, well, I suppose there could be some culture where that social construct of morality would be acceptable. And then the panel moderator said, do you have any further questions? And I said, no, I do not. And my friends, the room which was filled with many unbelievers, the air went out of the room. They could not believe what they had just heard. But that is precisely the predicament of those that have bought into the kind of relativism that is in the air in our own day and age. They're incapable of calling anything evil and wrong in any kind of an absolute sense. So, for postmodernism, ethics like knowledge is a linguistic construct. Social good is whatever society takes it to be. And then Seventh Sire says, and this will be no surprise to you, postmodernism is constantly in flux. When you have a, a system that's, quote-unquote, built on the foundation of relativism, it's going to be constantly in flux. Now, I think those are helpful things for us to know about postmodernism. But what you also need to know is that there are many Christians today saying that the church needs to embrace postmodernism if we are going to effectively uh, reach a postmodern culture. And I want to say just a few things about that very quickly uh, before we come to the Apostle Paul and how he responded to this kind of uh, argumentation in his own day. What are some of the ways that postmodernism, if embraced, will affect Christianity? Well, let me give you six ways that it would affect Christianity if embraced in any kind of consistency. First of all, postmodernism, if embraced, will assert that all religions boil down to the same thing. All religions boil down to the same thing. If theology, if religious language, if doctrine anyway, is simply a social construct by which we try and make sense of things that can't made, be made sense of, then really all theology is the same thing. Second, if postmodernism is embraced then Christians will embrace the idea that what's true for me may not be true for you. Now, I want to commend you to really think about this hard in your churches because it is my prediction to you that there are many of your young people, especially in high school and in college, 
who sit in Sunday school classes and church meetings, and they hear faithful Bible teachers and preachers say to them, the Bible says this about that. The Bible says that Jesus is the Son of God. The Bible says that Jesus is the only way of salvation. And the young people that are sitting there really believe that. They believe that Jesus is the only way of salvation. If you ask them, do you believe that Jesus is the only way of salvation? They'll say, yes, I believe that Jesus is the only way of salvation. But when they go out with their friends, they are loath to claim that Jesus is the only way of salvation for their friends. Jesus may be the only way of salvation for me, but who am I to say that Jesus is the only way of salvation for everyone? And you will find that kind of effect repeatedly on young people because they're in a culture where they know that the inherent claim that Jesus is the only way is totally out of step with the mindset of the world around them. So this idea that what's true for you may not be true for me has deeply permeated even evangelical churches. And I think it's another reason why we really need to be addressing these things in high school. By the way, I can't think of a better popular book to do that than the little book, Chris Chrisman Goes to College. Chris Chrisman Goes to College. It's by James Sire. And it's about a young man from an evangelical church that goes, on, goes off to a fictitious university called Handsome State University, which is thin, a thinly veiled reference to Cal Berkeley, and experiences relativism and pluralism and individualism and all sorts of other in, uh, isms, not just in the classroom, but in his relationships in the dorms with his fellow students and thus has his beliefs called into question. Third, if postmodernism is embraced, then there will be the idea that all religious systems followed sincerely lead to the same spiritual reality. All roads lead up the mountain. And woe to you if you suggest that the sincere believer of another religious system is not going to end up with the same eternal reward that you expect for yourself. Now, you heard that in Dr. MacArthur's talk today as he was describing the outlook of, of even one of the preeminent spokesmen for evangelicalism over the last 50 years. Fourth, if postmodernism is in, embraced, no religious assertions can claim to be true, and they're all subject to revision. This is one reason why people don't like doctrine. Ooh, that's just so dogmatic. <laughs> who, who am I to say that Jesus is divine? Who am I to say that you must repent and believe or perish? That's just so dogmatic. Fifth, if you embrace postmodernism and attempt to combine it with Christianity, truth claims will simply become linguistic constructs derived from our own presuppositions. They're about imposing our own uh, preferences on religion and on the text. And sixth, if postmodernism is embraced with any kind of consistency, it will view religious assertions as good only insofar as they help people live in harmony. If you believe a doctrine that privileges one group of people over the other salvifically, or if you believe in a doctrine that calls into question the morality of some group of people, watch out if you're in the presence of postmodernists. Again, I was... Uh, being interviewed by a university president as we were trying to get a Christian college campus fellowship on a local liberal arts uh, campus. And that university president, frankly, did not care anything about our doctrine. They didn't care, she, she did not care anything about what we were going to teach as long as we were not going to question homosexuality and gender preferences on her campus. As long as we 
would not call homosexuality sin. And as long as we were uh, in favor of denying any gender distinctions in the life of the Christian in the home or in the church, she did not care about anything else that we taught. And it was a classic example of they're happy to have a religious group there as long as that religious group promotes people living in harmony. And if the doctrine gets in the way, so much worse for the doctrine. Now, all of those are potential effects of postmodernism when it is embraced by the church. I think you can see from all of them how problematic it is. And that is why I give the answer, no, the church should not embrace postmodernism. Does postmodernism have nothing to commend it? Oh, certainly there are things in which postmodernism's critique of secular modernism is very insightful. But does it have anything of substance to commend itself to us that we would want to build on? No. Furthermore, I want to draw your attention to the Apostle Paul's dealing with two dominant cultural outlooks in his own day. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Just a few verses from 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18 to 25. For the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You see what the Apostle Paul is doing there? In the context of ministering in a multicultural setting, both to Jews and Greeks, he came up against Jews who said, we are offended by the very idea of a crucified Messiah. And if you want a hearing, you're going to have to show us miraculous signs. And then to the Greeks, he encountered yet another objection. To the Greeks, the idea of a crucified and resurrected Messiah was intellectually foolish. It was culturally beneath them. It was intellectually ridiculous. And they wanted wisdom. They wanted sophisticated words and habits of thought on display if they were going to accept as compelling the arguments of the Apostle Paul. And so the Apostle Paul sizes this up and says, now let me get this right. You're not going to have, you're not going to hear me out Because you don't like the message of the crucified Messiah. And instead, you'd like wisdom or you'd like signs. Is that correct? And they say, yes. And then Paul's response is, well, I guess we're just going to have to change Christianity and go in the direction of wisdom and signs. No. He says, okay, let me get this straight. You're going to reject the gospel message unless I give you Greek wisdom and Jewish signs. Nope. I'm going to preach Christ crucified because he is the wisdom and the power of God. So postmodernism doesn't get to tell us what message we're going to say to the culture. God gets to tell us what message we're going to say to the culture. And I think it's so important that we understand where our marching orders come from. Christianity has not grown under the blessing of the sovereign God and the power of the Holy Spirit because it has attempted to accommodate itself to every objection 
but because it has been faithful to the Word of God and it has been ready to answer every objection and reject every pretension to wisdom that is placed before it and to respond with the wisdom of God. And we don't get our marching orders from the culture. We want to understand the culture so that we can speak intelligently into the culture. The culture and the philosophy of this age doesn't provide us with our message May God help us to be faithful to the word of the cross, even in this day and age of postmodernism. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bow before you, and we ask that you would help us to understand our times, but to be sure that we understand your word even better than we understand our times, and that we would speak your word faithfully and clearly and intelligently into the culture in which we live and of which we are a part, but that we will not compromise your truth and attempt to improve it by intermingling it with the foolishness of this age. For the gospel is the power and the wisdom of God, and even our weakness in the eyes of the world is strength because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Help us to believe that and to live that in Jesus' name. Amen.